Contenders, ready! Gladiators, ready! Three, two, one! The Gladiators! Hello and welcome to the Glad Pod in association with Gladiators TV. I'm David Blackmore and with me as always is producer Paul and Jet. Now, diving into the mailbag for this week, and there is a lovely email from Lee Walker. Hi, Lee. I'll read it first, but it did prompt a question from me for you, Paul, and Di. Now, he starts by revealing two things. Firstly, that he was pen pals with Paul. Secondly, (laughs) after reading an interview with Jet, where she said she loved dolphins, he bought her a pair of silver dolphin ear studs from Argos, where else with his pocket money and posted them to her via the gladiators fan club so paul coming to you first were you big into the pen palling pen palling is that what you say in those days i mean how dodgy is it that you could basically write in to the gladiators magazine with your name age address and sometimes even a photograph and it'd be published in a national magazine and sent all around the UK and then have random people writing to you as a child but yes me and Lee were pen pals back in the day I always remember that he would draw all of the gladiators logos around the the letter that he would write which was just totally epic I always remember that standing out as as one of the key things from him but yes I did have many pen pals across the country and even some abroad in America as well so many that I actually couldn't write to them all so I ended up creating a gladiators newsletter and charging them all 20p with all of this information that I would ring up the London weekend television press office and speak to a lady called Anna Conrich who used to give me all of the latest goings on in in the world of gladiators gladiators like which gladiators were potentially leaving if they were going to get any new games and then i'd publish this in a in a letter in charge of everyone 20p plus a stamped adjust envelope as well i love that so it basically like you know the gladiators struggled to keep up with the, the fan club messages as well you also struggled to keep up with the sheer volume of pen pals that wanting to you must have been prolific and the fact that people wanted to get in touch with you shows like the love that they had for you to find out more information as well and i love that you called up the press office i didn't know this that you called up the press office to get the latest information to, for the newsletter and how entrepreneurial is that that you then charge them to, you know to do it but how much must you spent on postage back then it must have been well no I, they gave me a stamp to just envelope as well so i didn't even <sighs> have to pay for that so <laughs> oh my god <laughs> all i wanted because i had to get permission from from lwt funnily enough which sounds so bizarre because i was about 12 years old when this was happening and i remember having to send examples off to the press office for them to see it and and they were like, it's fine as long as you don't make any money on it. So I, basically the 20p was to cover the printing costs of my home printer, just printing out all of these different versions each month. So, And Di, Lee had mentioned there about the silver dolphin ear studs. Did you get a lot of dolphin inspired presents that you particularly remember? Drawings, yes. Lee, I am so sorry. I can't remember ever receiving dolphin stud earrings. And I'm gutted, actually. <laughs> I'm absolutely gutted because I, I did go and visit America around about the early two years of Gladiators and I got the wonderful opportunity to swim with two dolphins in a, in a natural lagoon rather than in a pool because obviously that affects their sonar and everything. And it was an absolute pleasure. It was the shortest trip of my life, four days, right across the globe. Uh, and I was with the real deal, so yeah. Well, I mean, I'm guessing that you were so inundated with loads of gifts as well that uh, I'm guessing the mailbags must have been absolutely bulging at, at this time in, in particular. I give Diane back then. <laughs> First time that I ever met you, Di, I brought you a wooden necklace that I made in my woodwork class at school. I know. Do you know what? Well, I, I do. I can't for the life of me locate where it's where it's ever gone. But I do remember that, and I remember thinking. I just remember how I'm going to say it now. How gorgeous. I mean, was you? We were eleven when I first met you. Or you twelve? Ten. You were just ten. And I remember the badge. One of the crowd <laughs> and one of myself almost were bigger than you. <laughs> <laughs> at the Darlington Civic Theatre in my first year with Cobra doing a, one of the many 20-odd pantos that I went on to do. So yes, gifts were a huge thing. I mean, we had to be careful. But in those days, you could get sacked. I mean, literally an, orig- an original sack made of sacking. Oh, 
filled with, with postal mail pre, as you said, so, social media. So goodness knows what it's going to be like today. For me, it would just be a completely different world. Daunting, actually. But exciting. Exciting for, for today's, today's media people. Definitely. Let's start a new strand on this podcast, which is what have you ever sent Di? And then let's see if she can remember whether she received it or not. <laughs> Do you know what one of the most dirty well, things was? We, well, we nicknamed him the Unicorn Man in my household when I used to go and visit my family up in the northeast because I'd get these little, you remember, um, is it Plaster of Paris where you could set things into moulds? And I'd get these beautiful little Plaster of Paris unicorns that were painted all sorts of different colours. <laughs> so whoever you were, Unicorn Man, I think you were from Birmingham. I do thank you and I will never forget them. <laughs> Let's start a new strand on this podcast. Who can, who's Unicorn Man? Let's track him down. He's <laughs> We need line of duty. We need Martin Compson here. We we need the team. <laughs> it's gonna be the new it's gonna be the new H. Lee goes on and shares one of his most treasured memories of his dad, who who sadly passed away seventeen years ago. But it includes you, Diane, and I loved it, so I wanted to read it out. So he was there in Birmingham for the first quarter final of nineteen ninety three, the one with Pauline Oliver versus Nightshade grudge match that he puts there. Now he remembers stepping into the arena for that first time and seeing those blue neon lights, the gladiators being introduced to their individual theme music, him being shy doing the, the Mexican wave. It's quite daunting if you if you haven't done it before. But his dad absolutely going for it. And my dad used to always do things like that. And seeing Jet win with ease on the wall. I mean, that could pretty much be any of the episodes that she was on the wall. Although they were sat right down the opposite end of the arena. I will come to you quickly on this point, Paul. Sitting down the opposite end of the arena, was that a tough watch then? Because you felt you felt you so far away from the wall on the other side. I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think there was really a bad place to sit within the arena. I mean, I sat all over in many different seats. And I think it was what the producers were really, really good about was that they would create games where the audience could always see what was going on so there wasn't really a bad place to say i think maybe the worst event to see sometimes was pyramid because you could only really see one side of it if you were sat on either the left or right but yeah no the atmosphere and everything would just take over so yeah i don't really think there was a bad place i just had this vision especially if we go to some events now and you look at like if you're so far away like especially when you go to geek sometimes like the artist is so teeny tiny on the stage you end up just watching the screens um anyway then hang tough was being set up and one of the platforms was directly in front of him. And Lee says that he can still hear his dad vividly saying, wouldn't it be great if the gladiator starts from this end and it's Jet? With that, Jet entered the arena, cartwheel her way to their platform. And he even remembers turning to his dad as soon as he realised and the look that he gave him. And then during the event, you can see dad and Lee wearing his brand new gladiator sweatshirt in the background, sharing the screen with Jet. Producer Paul, this is, this is a challenge for you. I want to see if you can find this frame and see if you can <laughs> if you can put it on, on social. Oh, I, do. Um, I mean, first and foremost, that is such a lovely memory of your dad. But it got me thinking, Paul and Di, for events like Hang Tough, did the gladiators change platforms or weren't they always on one side? Because reading that, and I don't know whether this is like the Nelson Mandela effect, where I've always assumed that they were always on one side or the other. See, I thought I could always see them on both sides, but I don't know whether that's because the camera changed either side. Paul, I know that you're the oracle on all these things. So did they always start on the same side? Well, for Hang Tough, yeah, the Gladiator always started on the left-hand side of the arena if you were looking at it from a TV point of view, looking down with the walls either side in shot. So no, the, the Gladiators always did stay on the left-hand side. However, for some of the other events like suspension brids, for some unknown reason, the, the Gladiators and Contenders throughout the series did switch sides, which I, I'm not sure why they why they did that. But no, generally, it, like Jewel, for example, they, the Gladiator was always on the left-hand side as well. So why do I remember seeing Gladiators from other sides? Would that be the, the camera angle? showing say for hang tough hang tough's the one that I, i'm visualizing i'm sure sometimes i've seen them on the left and the right would it just be that the camera would have been on the other side so therefore it would have been left screen or, or right of screen am i going mad is this a new strand is david going mad <laughs> <laughs> i think for hang tough specifically the cameras always were facing the same way so that it didn't confuse the viewer of like switching angles to be like where's the gladiator where's the contender it might have been i'm trying to think of all of the international versions 
as if they might have been slightly different but no i think the camera angles were pretty much accurate so maybe you just saw some versions where the contender had got in front of the gladiator and then the gladiator looks like they're on the, the right hand side yeah maybe i'm just going mad no they're not it I, I what i remember about hang tough is you'd we'd have some cranes at the, the bottom end of the arena and what i mean by that is when you're looking up to the arena your right wall of the one on your left hand wall right hand wall and then they'd bring down the rig from the ceiling and it would then be suspended over big uh big platforms on casters which would come out and i think they could actually set that piece up i think they got it down to about 10 to 15 minutes which is huge because it was a huge big event to rig and then what they did is they i remember them saying we have nine cameras live shooting this that may not be re- remarkable in today's world world of digital how however back then it was 35 mil film so and it's because we really needed to cover from every angle because you could never re-record any of the events so it was a, it was a competition for money and it would have then literally been rigged so we couldn't do it we had to cover from every angle and they would shoot up the rig they'd have you on each platform probably your own camera which would do you do your id or your air your your hair flick or your free cartwheel or whatever it is you did and you'd be given your own personal camera to do that too well there you go i mean i think that i I, hopefully that clears it up and there's plenty there for you guys to email in about um so you can get in touch with us as always on the glad pod by emailing gladpod at gladiators tv.com or sliding into our dms on instagram facebook or twitter but for now let's get on with this week's episode three two Welcome to the Glad Pod, and I can't tell you how excited I have been for quite some time in the hope that we would get this amazing person to join us and give us his story. It's Jefferson King, and to you and I, we know him as Shadow. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Nice to see you, Diane. He's undefeated. He's awesome. He's Shadow. What needs to be said? He's back. It took 15 years to build that body, and it's going to take a great contender to take it apart. Yes, the boys are back in town. Let's go right back to the beginning. You were an athlete before Gladiators. How did yeah. Gladiators actually come into your life? So I used to watch the American Gladiators on a Friday night. It used to come on like three o'clock in the morning. Right? And I used to watch that when I come back from nightclubs and stuff. I used to watch that. And uh, they said they were looking for people to start a new program. I just applied. I applied for it. I mean, I was just about to turn professional in, in bodybuilding at the time. But I thought, you know what? This might be a nice little angle for me, you know, to use my body to do such a thing. And uh, that was it, really. Yeah. Yeah, just applied for it and uh, was put on a short list. Don't know how many people actually applied for it at the time. Put on a short list, taken down to, I think it was Woolwich Army Barracks. That's right. Yeah, and put through all the season that inside the gym, outside the gym on the assault course and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it was great fun. Great it fun. was filmed, wasn't it, as well, those tryouts? Yeah, 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 yeah. And you teamed up with Warrior for your tryout, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, me and Warrior. We had to, inside the gym, we had to climb climb a rope. I remember Saracen was there. I didn't realise he was a fireman at the time, but Saracen went up like three times just using his his arms yeah me and warrior being so heavy and everything i think we managed like one and a half times but it was a struggle you know it was a struggle to get up there i mean unless you know how to climb a rope you can't just use brute strength to get up there but uh saracen did <laughs> he did it he actually went up in a v-sit didn't he he sort of yeah, 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 yeah. sailed up in a v- <laughs> and then all the way down three times yeah. it was pretty impressive i must admit yeah, it was, it what was. do you remember about the tryouts what was it like for you atmospherically it was good it was it was was great I, I i thoroughly enjoyed it you know i thoroughly enjoyed the pt instructors being being around being next to you and pu- egging you on pushing you yeah. on. and you know uh, you know there was an end result so i was like giving 110 percent. you know it was, it was great it was great fun did you have a keen sense that this was going to be something life-changing for you at that stage no not at all you know it was just um i, I like i said i never set out to be on tv and the concept of it being on TV and becoming a celebrity or becoming someone that's well known didn't didn't uh, register with me at the at the time. Uh, it was just a uh, you know yeah I'll have some of that you know I wouldn't mind doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Casual. <laughs> so what was the moment where you actually got the okay Jeff 
you're in. How did that make you feel? Elated. I couldn't believe it. You know, like I said, I heard that thousands of people all over the country had tried out, and uh, to be picked, to be put on the shortlist, it was a, it was a, a moment in my in my, in my life. Yeah. You've had a bodybuilding background, but that is an incredibly functionally fit arena to be in. So you had another sporting background, didn't you, before, which meant that you actually had the speed, the strength, the stamina. I grew up, I grew up in America. My mother used to live in New York, so I grew up there from the age of fourteen and going to high school there. I, I played America. And football so you know yeah I suppose I was a bit agile and you know fit in in that, in that sense yeah and you were by far Nigel's favorite because you look you just perfect I love Nigel I would actually love to talk to Nigel and just you know say thank you and you know apologize partly but yeah Nigel yeah I love Nigel nice guy nice guy well he actually mm. came on the glad pod oh no honestly it broke his heart to, to say goodbye it really did I remember he used to say to me before before I, before I went into the arena he said to me I just want to see the whites of those eyes just yeah. the whites of those eyes and give them half a chance Shadow. don't just take them off you know within seconds <laughs> you then beat you up a little bit and then, and then take them off <laughs> yeah and I think when I look back at all those memories you have of watching gladiators and there are certain moments that just instantly come to mind and yeah the whites of your eyes is definitely one of those on dual growling at the sure. person opposite sure. you. Uh, people always say to me, uh, you know, the white's wise and why was I, you know, it, I, I was actually looking through you, if, you, if that means anything to you. I, I, I wasn't actually looking at the person that was in front of me. I was looking through them. You know, they were just an object that I was going to deliver some thunder to, you know. <laughs> You've heard all the stories about Shadow's eyes. There was a bit of talking going on up there, a bit of psyching each other out. He loves a bit of grunting. He loves a bit of grunting. Um... I didn't look at his eyes. I didn't think that was going to achieve anything. I used to remember backstage, you'd get yourself so psyched up as well. Yeah, I used to, I used to put on the headphones and uh, listen to Public Enemy and get all ready. Wouldn't talk to no one. I think we all just sit in the pink pen and go, whoa. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but did you need to do that, Jeff? Was that, is that what you needed to do to get you in the, that zone, in that state? Yeah, 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 abs- absolutely. You know, um, entering, entering the arena and um, looking the way I did. And, and I was going to show you what a person who looks like me is going to do to you, the challenge I'm going to give you. Yeah, so for, for me, getting in the zone and performing was what it was all about for me, you know, entering entering that arena and being totally focused job at hand and and taking care of it really what did you think of the name shadow yeah you know, you know I, I didn't i didn't really look too deep into it you know i've had people say to me uh did you think it was racist or why do they call you shadow is it because you're so black or was it because you're so big yeah you know so big so black so like shutting out the light you know that's how that's how I took it. I, di- I didn't take it any other way, really. How did you find being such a, a role model as well during that time? Because they really they they did look after us, didn't they, to some yeah. degree? I think in the first year, I didn't realise what what was going to happen or, or or what effect it it had on the general public, but. Within the second year, I remember um, going down the wrong corridor or something in the NEC arena, ended up going through some exit doors, and I, and I was in the walkways where, where everybody was. And uh, I think I was with Flame at the time, actually, and we just got totally rushed. Really. That's when it, when it came to you that, wow, so that we're celebrities, or we are, we are of some kind of a status, because the way that people just came to us, they were surprised to see us step out into the corridor, and like I said, took the wrong, pushed the wrong door, just mobbed. It was interesting, wasn't it? When we go back to the hotel, and if we had a day off, we wanted to all walk into town, didn't we? Yeah. Easier for the girls to hide. But I'd imagine you walking around the bull ring and burning. You must have got mobbed. Oh uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. What could what could I say to that? I mean, you, did you enjoy that bit of it though? Yeah, I did. I did. Yeah. You know, being recognised for something that that you did that people yeah. enjoyed, you know, found it exciting. Was um, yeah, it was great. To take us right back to that moment when you first walked into the arena because we had a huge arena compared to the Americans. It was yeah. like a cathedral like, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, it was. It was pretty it was pretty daunting. But you know, yeah. being a team leader and, and you know, bringing my people together and walking as a team and soldiers, you know, and taking care of the arena. This is our house. This is our arena. You know, we can what goes on in here. And having that having that spirit it was great. How did team leader come about then? Who actually mentioned No, I remember one day we was um I think we was in a meeting and Nightshade, I think they were introducing Nightshade to us. She just joined us. I don't know how it came about, but I remember Saracen questioning the fact, why should there be a team of team leader? Why can't we all be at the same yeah, you know, there has to be someone that sets the path for everyone else. There has to be someone that motivates everybody else. There has to be someone that 
you know, brings us all together. And I just happen to be that person. I mean, that is one of my traits is uh, bringing people together, motivating people. How it came about, I don't know. Why they decided to have a team leader, I don't know. But I'm glad they did. And there you are, leading out the team, all of you guys and gals in uh, Lycra costumes. What did you make <laughs> of your outfit? <laughs> yeah, no, I never really put too much thought into that. But yeah, I suppose when you when you say it like that, <laughs> Lycra. <laughs> yeah. Well, what else were we going to wear? <laughs> That's very true. I remember you used to always have a bum bag. Oh, yeah. I used to have a bum bag with the old flip phone, knit Motorola flip phone and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. And your cat. And my cat. Have you still got the cat, by the way, the gladiator I, cat? I, 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 I think I don't. I think my my uh, my ex wife does. I think she 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 collected a lot of memorabilia. You know the uh, the sticker books and the comic books, and she has a lot of stuff. As far as my kids have told me, myself, no, I don't. I don't even have my out my outfit, my my track suit, my my jacket that I used to wear. The Americans used to have like a leather jacket with red, white, and blue patches on it, and I had one made shadow down the arm in it. And I had it in my gym, but um, I don't know. Someone along the way took it as a souvenir, just like they took my number plate off my car and everything you know just is that a thing did that really happen I went to do a gig somewhere i can't remember where sunderland newcastle somewhere like that and um my had my jeep outside and um uh, someone unscrewed the, the the number plate and, and took it off it wasn't me it wasn't me <laughs> <laughs> but shadow i always remember you used to have the g shaved into the back of your yeah, head yeah 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 one year i decided uh this good we used to go to a place to go and get a haircut and everything in birmingham and i just decided to um yeah sculpt out a G in the back of my head. And I think there was a few little kids that used to have their Gs in the back of their heads as well. <laughs> don't ask me. Don't ask me why I did that, but um, I did. Yeah. The Sunday Times, LWT's new big hitter, and they don't get much bigger and hit harder than the awesome hammer blows of Shadow. Let's take a listen to what some of the audience at Gladiator Arena thought. Better than wrestling. Better than Hulk Hogan? Yeah. yeah. Shadow is. What do you like about Shadow? Oh, he's a man. He's a real man. <laughs> So let's go back into the arena and the events themselves. You excelled yeah. so many of them. What springs to mind when we talk about the events? The draw. That was the only one-on-one -on -one game that was played. On guard. Three, two, one. Both guys holding off from that initial. Oh, my goodness, Bill's down. It can only be said that the shadow is back. I used to enjoy the gauntlet. I used to enjoy Powerball. I used to enjoy the pyramid. I used to enjoy Skytrack upside down on the ceiling. This is for all my little shadows all over the country. All those little kids that I visit all over the country, this is for you, from the Shadow Man. Word. Saracen and Shadow with a job to do. Saracen's on Roland and Shadow pursuing Steve. Three. first time and look at shadow a storming start wow takes his man out and saracen what a whitewash well that was over before it started i think we had to see that again in slow motion please and look at this when you think about the weight of those guys up there 20 stone defying gravity and the mobility incredible did you ever hang tough Hang tough. I did. Do, I did do hang tough a couple of times. Uh, I did. Yeah. Um, I think that was Saracen's um, game, though. But I mean, we all took turns doing most of the games. We all had to sort, of, you know, get involved in most of the games. But um, yeah, I done hang tough. I enjoyed that as well. You know, the fifty rings or whatever it was. Pretty daunting when you set out and you have to like, you know, they're coming towards you and they're trying to, you know, evade you and you're trying to catch them and. Once you grab all of them, you've got to pull them off. And that, yeah, it was all great fun. You did hang tough eight times. Won five, drew twice, lost once. So that's not a bad record on hang tough. I didn't realise that, man. Well, you see, the old memory is uh, fading 30 years ago. <laughs> well, it's not very often we see Shadow on the rings, undefeated in duel, but not really built for this event. Still, the big man looking very comfortable. Get that weight around your body and you're in trouble. Oh, he's got him in the body scissors. And it's definitely... Good night, Vienna! And Ken's wife, Donna, looks disappointed, but I'm not sure his little son, Elliot, knows what's going on. In 
in the replay, Ken tries to push Shadow's body away, but Shadow's leg snaps shut like a vice. Another one bites the dust. Now, for me, I've always, you know, as soon as you said duel, for me, growing up, Shadow equals duel. Yeah. Uh, duel equals you're going to get battered by Shadow. Um, <laughs> and in my head, I, I, it was only when I was thinking about it ahead of speaking with you, I always assumed you were undefeated. But then I remembered. Don't remind me. Don't remind me. Go on, Go on then. And I can remember. And I, it took me straight back to that moment and seeing it and just watching it in shock. I was in shock too. I think it was Gary Mason. He stepped across. I didn't realise that he stepped across and pushed me off. I actually thought that he had jabbed me with the pugil stick to my midriff, midriff. And I just remember like floating, floating <laughs> down the mats. I was in shock myself. And then uh, I remember everyone was coming around me and saying, yo, Shadow, fight him again, fight him again. You know, well, he won fair and square. No, he stepped across. So I thought, all right, went up there again. And my, I think my pugil stick touched his platform and the referee decided to make it a, a draw. Yeah, but yeah, I, I, I was, um, I was in shock too. All the way down to the mat, I was in shock. <laughs> <laughs> and that's quite some fall as well, isn't it? Yeah. Well, this is the one you've all been waiting for. The battle of the heavyweights. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Gary Mason. Undefeated British heavyweight champion between 89 and 91. And Shadow. Undefeated dual champion since 1992. Three, two... One! Let's get ready to rumble! Oh, Gary steps across, disqualified. Shadow's down, but he's not out. The result of that contest was a win to the Gladiator because of the push. However, because we are all interested in a good competition, it will be refought. Yes, It is not permitted for either the gladiator or the contender to step across or put a hand across. They must stay on their own podium. Three, two, one. A rematch means if Gary wins, he'll only pick up five points having lost the first duel. And there's Shadow, what a good lick. Oh, he sways back and Shadow puts his hand across. He's disqualified, Gary doesn't realize it. And as John Anderson said earlier, you can't touch the other podium, but great sportsmanship. And the Christmas club delighted. Shadow wins the first, Gary takes the second, it's a draw. How did you get on with John Anderson and the ref, the ref team? Uh, John Anderson, a great man. He did say it's a pleasure training for me and I was very professional and, and I tried to be very professional. I enjoyed it thoroughly, you know, mo most things are, I do, you know. Good or bad, a sort of take them on foreheaded sort of thing, you know. But yeah, I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed it, and uh, he enjoyed me. I would like to say hi to him as well. Talk about reunions. We've, we've just with these comic cons that have been going through the UK, UK for however many years, sort of end up being a little bit reunion night. But you've got to be with us. I was going to say when you mentioned reunion, I remember the first reunion that you guys had, and. I wasn't invited. No, and that was in London, wasn't it? It was a long time ago. Long time ago. I don't have no idea why, but I used to think to myself, my God, the, the nation must be sitting there thinking, well, how can you have a reunion? In no, you know, I think there was only about three girls. <laughs> I did hear that you didn't all turn up, but you wasn't there. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, I think the idea was to get us together. But I think there's when there's been some events like Comic Cons or when there's been like a, a an anniversary for the show, they'll get three or four people in the studio, won't they? And and that sort of becomes a reunion of such. But it'd be great to get every one of the original cast together. It would it would? I mean, and I would love to be there as well and, and see you guys. You know, um, I'd all love to see you. I know for sure. Yeah, I would love to see all you guys. But I, I, I you know, I spoke to uh, Scorpio uh, online and um, I'm going to meet up with her and go and have a coffee and that but um, Sarah and I've spoken online lightning yourself and it, you know it's very warming for me because I haven't spoken to you guys or seen you guys for one dot you know last 30 years you know what I can promise you will cry with laughter at the camaraderie that still exists <laughs> memories of yeah. all the odd things yeah. that only us would have seen back sure. then and behind and, and the pressure as well that we all shared during the journey with that yeah. I mean we all used to you know come together in Birmingham and be in the NEC be at, I mean be in the uh the Hyatt Hotel and live together for two weeks so while we were filming and yeah, the stresses and the ups and the lows and just the whole 
It was a good family affair. Do you remember in the first uh, the VAT series, though, when <laughs> you guys were eating the NIA out of home mm. because you, you wanted all your lean chicken breasts and yeah. like yeah. really yeah. clean, brilliant yeah. food, and then everyone sort of got banned or barred from being as much. And you know, all like, around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Jeff, who, who did you get on best with the show out of the Gladiators? I find it hard to sort of single out one person. You know, Cobra used to make me laugh. He was a bit of a comedian. We all pretty much got got along with each other. Not because we, we had to. I think, you know, we, we all came from different walks of life and we was all brought together to, to produce something to, you know, I think that's what our bond was, was the fact that we all came together as a family. You know, we all had a mission, you know, we, we all entered the arena and our job was to provide a challenge and... And it was a good team, a good team effort, a good team bonding. And you've mentioned some of your favourite events, but what were your least favourite events? It's funny you say that. I, I, I didn't not like doing any of the events. You know, I, I wish I could have done a, was it a swing shot where they bounce down on the on the bungee cords and jump up and catch the balls and that. I think me and Warrior was a bit too heavy to jump down and bounce back up again. Yeah, you know, I, I, I missed out on that one. Yeah, I wouldn't have minded doing, um, which which came after me, was the, the, the ball with the mesh around it and you had to climb, climb around it. I enjoyed all the games, all the games I enjoyed. How did it change your life and your family at the time on becoming a gladiator? My kids were only babies. They were born in 94, so. Remember? Yeah. yeah. They were only babies. How did it change my life, did you say? Yeah, and the, and the people around you in the gym that like you drained at and everything. You couldn't walk the street. It was great, you know, to be somebody, you know, be recognised. Like I said, be recognised for something that you did that happened to be, you know, uh, something that the whole nation saw on a Saturday night, primetime TV. I think it was bigger than Blind Date, bigger than Noel's House Party. And at that time, there wasn't too many programmes to watch. They're the main core programmes on a Saturday night, you know, before people went out partying or whatever. They would watch, sit down and watch Gladiators. Great experience. Was it true that you and Cobra sometimes would go with having had Guinness in between the shows? <laughs> I read that somewhere and um, I don't know what to say to that, Diane. I was a bit taken back by that, to be honest with you. I wasn't impressed with that. No. no. I think Ricky's gone on record, hasn't he? He was saying that he would enjoy a sort of a drink every so often to go into the arena when we interviewed him. I truly don't remember between going for breakfast in the morning and getting ready to go into the arena at two o'clock for the first show um, ever going somewhere or, or having a pint of Guinness, let alone six pints of Guinness. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, 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 I was pretty much dis disturbed when I when I read that. You know, I, I was I wasn't happy. I thought to myself, my God, why would you say something like that? No. Yeah, I'm surprised. No, no, three pints and I'm drunk. So how did I, you know, six pints and go into the arena and stand on that platform twelve foot up in the air? I was I was going to say as well, Jeff, because like as a, a massive super fan of the show, for me, you were the true gladiator. You lived, breathed, like everything that being, oh, I... being a gladiator was, you represented and it was very authentic and you could just tell that you absolutely loved being a gladiator as well. I, I appreciate that. I, I, I truly believe, yes, I was the backbone of gladiators in the sense of uh, the real the real side. Um, okay, Wolfman had a character to play, the big bad wolf, so he would get into trouble and it would be okay from the push people about and stuff like that. I, I was more of a no-nonsense type person. I wouldn't talk to contestants before the show. The only time I would talk to them is in the green room after the show. I don't want to know you. I don't want to get to know you because I am going to deliver. No! Yeah. So, you know, it's best that we don't talk and don't get to know each other before the show because this is business. And here comes a gentleman who epitomises that difficulty. Undefeated over two seasons in this event, and whenever a male contender arrives at Gladiator Arena, the first question they ask is, will I have to face Shadow in duel? And looking at these stats, you know why they ask it. 6'3 and 17 and a half stone. Shadow, a few words. There you had it from one of the contenders. You're the hardest hitter. You are the best. Well, you know, they're here for the ultimate challenge. And myself and my people... We're here to provide an ultimate challenge. Let's hear for Shadow! The Dark Destroyer! Yeah. 
and I think that's what set Gladiators aside from like obviously like all of the wrestling that was around in the 90s watching you in your competition you could see that it was so authentic and that winning up there actually meant something to you as well if, any, if anyone did survive the raft of me uh, uh, on the jaw I, I would step across and give them a hug and you know say respect because I, I know personally I've given you 150% and if you were to survive up there you know you did take a beating but you survived but to respect that <laughs> Time and Shadow unloading some awesome knockout blows. Anybody else will be horizontal by now. And Phil keeping a cool head. And a sore one. Keeping his balance and defending for all he's worth. And look at that. Shadow's lost a piece of his pugil stick. He's not only knocking the stuffing out of Phil, he's knocking the stuffing out of his pugil stick. Oh, this is awesome. How does he stay up there? Listen to that aggression. Shadow, the first one to congratulate Phil for surviving that onslaught. You played duel 31 times, you won 20, drew 9, and you technically lost 2. And the, the only proper defeat you had was against a contender called Ian Simpson in Heat 6 in 94, when there was 1.1 second on the clock left. Did I fall onto his platform? There's a, there's a difference when you get in, when you get beat. Knocked and... off, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think my momentum threw me onto his platform. Yes, I do remember that time, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Get ready to rumble as Ian gets a couple of shots in. Oh, and Shadow sitting back on this. Ian with some great counter punching. This is the real deal. And Shadow finding his range now. Over the top. Oh, into the chin. That helmet getting lower and lower. Oh, what's happened there? Shadow defeated the end of an era. Ian can't believe it. Shadow cut and nor can I. It's taken three years for a man to do that. It happens to the best of them. Tyson, Ali, Lennox Lewis. It's tough. Ian, I had my speech ready and prepared. I was going to say how unfair of us to put Shadow up there. I don't need to say anything. No longer undefeated. I got him off. My dream come true. He went down. Thank you. To the man, not many people see you off that. That's true, but it had to happen sometime. I give him more respect. Let's hear it for Shadow as nice, well. Nice. Terrific match. Well Shadow taking his defeat gracefully in the replay. We see that, in all honesty, it was Shadow's own weight that overbalanced him. But let's take nothing away from Ian. <laughs> One of the other amazing times when you literally broke your pugil stick across somebody's head and the end of it flew off into the arena and you just kind of stood there with the one-ended pugil stick and they kind of had to stop the battle and restart yeah. it. I, I think I was probably the only person ever to break sticks, you know. And what kind of power was coming behind them, you know, for them, for them sticks to be broke was uh, full on. And Shadow's really fired up now. Huge range finding blows. Oh, take that. Defending as well as he can. Shadow really throwing them at him. Oh, his pugil stick's broken! He's lost his end! And the referee stopped it. The sheer force of Shadow's blows. Matt could withstand them, but Shadow's stick couldn't. I've never seen anything like it. Flash is down there now. Shadow, what happened? Shadow, the stick broke. That's what happened. Is that because you were so cross, you were so mad? I guess so. You want to go again? Does he want to go again? He wants to go again. Let's go again. Do you want him to go again? I think they want to go again. Well, that's cleared that up. This really is a dramatic men's event. In the first duel, Shadow slips. In the second, he breaks his stick. And here he is again for more. <laughs> I don't know if you can remember the event where it was it was kind of like a duel it was called joust on the booking broncos yeah, where you yeah. go around yeah. you almost you also broke one of the combat clubs yeah. again on, yeah. on on the contender's head <laughs> <laughs> you know good memory i remember that game yeah I'd, um i used to i used to actually stand up on that bronco thing i was quite comfortable on that yeah i think it was the no fear aspect i think you know not having no fear of uh of failing my my, my quest to provide a challenge <laughs> Sorry for the doctor. Oh, his cover's come off 
off, he's broken his club. Oh, it's dust and bits of everything all over the place, and goodbye, Doctor. The Doctor caught a nasty dose of Gladiator. Once you carry into the arena, the thought of cameras, the thought of looking bad, losing games, you know, you, you've, you've kind of lost, you've lost your way a bit. You know, our, our job was just basically just to provide a challenge. So you, to go in there full hide and, and just deliver what you're supposed to deliver, you know, and not be concerned about the crowd and the cameras and, and losing games and looking bad. Just, you know, throw yourself 150% into what it is you were doing. That's right. I mean, I, I love the way you said that you were to, to provide a challenge. I, I always saw as, as a kind of a, a barrier to the way that a contender would then go on to win and become, you know, one of the winners of the series. And I think we all did a, a pretty good job of providing those barriers. To yes. You remember what it was like when you'd go to a signing and they'd have albums and dolls and things like that. Yeah, I found that. I found that. Uh, weird. It was weird as well. I mean, you, when you think of the American gladiators, yeah, they get repeat fees from every state that shows the program. They get merchandise rights. We, we never got anything like that. We got a flat wage per show. You know, you could earn a few grand or whatever during the month doing personal appearances opening up shops and stuff like that but we didn't get no merchandise rights and no repeat fees and that was the difference between us and them and then look at our show compared to theirs believe that we should have we should have had a percentage of merchandise actually that was like a massive rumor that the americans got merchandise and rights and repeat shows they actually didn't they didn't get any of that there's been a netflix documentary released recently and the american gladiators team actually all walked out when they tried to get those rights added into their contract samuel goldwyn company were like no we don't we don't renegotiate our contracts rumor of them getting all of that rights and all of that money was actually is that is not true yeah they didn't get it. it was very much similar to, to you guys that there was not a merchandising cut despite the likes of like you, Jet and, and Wolf having your faces across everything. Well, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked to hear that. I really am. I thought that was the case. I thought that these guys uh, were like, you know, literally all millionaires. If you watch the, the Netflix documentary Muscles and Mayhem, yeah, you'll see that they actually had a very similar experience to, to what you guys did. But it was nice to see the merchandise. It was nice to see little dolls, you know, and even even now, I've uh, I've worked in certain places and people all of a sudden turned up with a plastic doll and, or, or or the kudo sticks, the ones that you blow up and want me to sign them and stuff like that. So it's yeah. yeah. But you know, we are part of such a big fond memory of for people thirty years ago who were children back yeah. then. Yeah, and like the merch would have been really really important uh, to good. them as keepsakes. <laughs> So, Shadow, you challenged Dean on the Gladiator War game and uh, lost. The new Gladiator War from Hornby. Amazing. If you want to be part of the action, you'll need one of my six Gladiators metallic action cards. There's the awesome Jet, the powerful Shadow, and the mighty Wolf. Free on special packs of Kellogg's Frosties. They're good. I remember having a guy come up to me one day at the train station, uh, a black guy, and came up to me and he said, uh, yeah, n nice to meet you. And, you know, I used to watch you, I used to watch you every Saturday night. Great fan. And he said that he used to he used to ask his mother, is this what I'm going to look like when I grow up? You know what I mean? Yeah, from a little, from a little boy, this is what he was looking at. <laughs> looking at me on the TV and thinking that that's how he was going to look, just to look like that because when he grows up <laughs> i've heard some nice stories of people that you know either started training or they've never never forgotten you know we, we did we did sort of leave a, an impression on people yeah a whole generation of people when i'm fighting with the poodle sticks what goes through my mind is uh to be relentless i give the contender the ultimate challenge hang tough stay in school love your parents and watch gladiators. So here we go, Jeff. I've got some stats here. I'm going to throw them your way right now. I want to get your reaction to them. Okay, so on Pyramid, you played five times, won once. On Tilt, played four, lost four. On the Wall, played eight, lost seven. In the first year, just like with the jaw, it was something they had to get used to. It was something that after the first year, things got better all round, really. But I think 
that it was a learning curve in the first in the mm -hmm. first you reading out those stats I I, I, I don't have a memory of uh, that, <laughs> that but my god you know yeah wow it was hard it was hard work that pyramid I think those steps are like uh or whatever tall and once you step on it, it it's, it's it's like walking up sand when you when you grab someone and tumble down and you've got to start again and go up to try and catch them yeah well, this pyramid's a bit top heavy with our two biggest gladiators up there shadow a great dive to take ball down and it's not so much the rolling down as the gladiator landing on you at the bottom as he's just found out with warrior on him what was the game that um, you had to walk around a pole and go up into the ceiling? And if you didn't get there in time, the, the knob would go inside. Yes, they'd what? retract inside and then you'd slide down. Like You fell from that uh, one of those uh, I did. I did. We were in rehearsals, and this is a point I was going to make a few minutes ago, but we actually didn't get a lot of training time on the events. No. What we had to do as athletes is find ways to mimic some of the, the muscle groups that would be involved, the functional fitness that would be involved before going back into the arena for the next season, the next year. But I remember the, the Polax one, I think I went up it, came off the very top, just 35 yeah. foot. Yeah. Or something like that. And I didn't keep my body stiff and strong on the airbag. And instead, I collapsed in. The airbag collapsed yeah. around me. Yeah. Do you remember what happened? Yeah. yeah. So Kate Zodiac came on the airbag. She crawled over it because she could hear me going, Oh, no, my nose. <laughs> And I looked at her and I went, Kate, please tell me my nose isn't broken. I could see <laughs> my nose out of my left eye. It was well, right over that side. Cartilage had come across. And she went, Jet, your nose is broken. I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah, there was lots of lots of lots of little accidents and some yeah. but a little as well for the contenders and gladiators. They had two weeks to prepare. We only had, like she said, a, a week to to, you know. Be introduced to new games or to you know get ready on the games um so it was a, it was a lot of pressure jeff what was it like competing in the international gladiators and and meeting sort of your over overseas counterpart that was great that was great when the americans came over i think was it the americans was there um were they swedish or it was something? it was russia finland america later australia and, and others joined as well yeah, it was great seeing the american gladiators yeah the, you know watching them like i said on a friday night and then actually them doing that and bringing the international gladiators together, that was great. And I'm sure the Americans were, were well impressed with our arena as well. Like I said, they do their thing in front of the cardboard Kyle. When they came into our arena, 10,000 plus, they must have been like, wow. America and Great Britain. Ready! Fans are kicking up their heels. Ready! I think they're looking forward to this. Hawk from the USA ready. Spartak from Russia Two, ready. Shadow one. from Great Britain. Let's go to it, guys. Kyler getting wrapped up by Shadow, but Paul Field gets away from Hawk to score. We're down to 10 seconds. Both Paul and Kyler are going to have some serious carpet burns when this one is all over. Oh, did you see that? Kyler knocked the basket away from himself before he could dunk the donut. It's all over. H4 to Paul Field. Gladiators made that a very exciting and fair game. Shadow? Uh, this is going to be one of the, the biggest tests for contenders. Uh, a lot of courage, a lot of speed involved. A lot of heart, too. All credit to them. Well done. Hawk. Fast, I tell you what, this is where we make a difference in this game. And this is where the contenders really prove themselves. Those two fellas, you got a lot of meat standing in front of you. Those two guys, they really came out and they scored some points. We didn't want them to score. They scored too many. But we did a good game. Yeah. It was a great game. Spartak. Great game. Great game. Lovely. Let's hear it for our gladiators. Hawk, Spartak, and Shadow. And then, Jeff, you're at the, the sort of the peak of your powers, and then it's all over. Yeah, just like that. What can I say to that? Because um... initially there was, the, was it the accusation of doing cocaine and testing positive for steroids um, whilst appearing in, in pantomime? But then LWT was stating there was nothing in any drugs test to indicate you taking cocaine, but then you'd be fired for the, the steroid abuse. I mean, how did it all play out for you that you can remember? Short and sweet, just as you said it, really. He was doing cocaine in a, in a, a restaurant in... King's Road, testing for steroids, yes. I think, you know, at the end of the day, when they wanted people that looked like us, especially with the men, not so much with the with the, 
with the females, but with the men. They wanted this superhuman looking uh, person to be going up against, you know, uh, athletic, normal looking people. And, and you know, the, it wouldn't have been the same if they had just athlete looking people up against athlete looking people. They knew where we came from. They knew our background, you know, <clears throat> I came from the bodybuilding world. Like I said, I was just about to turn pro when I got the job as a gladiator. It was no central television and it was the cook report. He was an in investigative journalist and he just started like sort of stalking, particularly the guys, didn't he? Particularly in Birmingham, we were kind of all warned. We're not athletes, you know, we're not, we're not, um, yeah. no, we're performers. Aren't we? No, I, you know, I personally just felt sorry for particularly the boys because you were selected for, as you said, looking and being a certain way. Yeah. And then the goalposts are being dramatically changed. Sure. And that psychologically must have been really hard, but I did watch all the boys become even better power to weight ratio athletes yeah. than sort of coming from a bodybuilder background, which sometimes is just separate muscle groups, isn't it? Sure, sure. Not good functional fitness. So actually it turned out to be a big positive. Yeah, a variety of uh, games and everything else. You had to bring in those other other muscle groups and other uh, uh, ways of uh, you know, performing. You had to go on Breakfast TV as well with Nigel Lifko, and we, we spoke about that on the Glad Pod with, with him to apologise to all the fans. I mean, I think Nigel was alluding to, I think, you know, in the States, it's the kind of thing that you can go on TV, kind of apologise and, and kind of then you can move on and have like a second chance. And did you feel like doing that was going to give you the opportunity to, to get back up? I was never given a second chance. You know, I was just uh, dismissed, simple, just like that, just dismissed. I wasn't given uh, an opportunity to uh, rectify or to um, clean my act up or, or anything. Um, I, you know, I don't have no bad feelings about that, but that's the way it was. That was it. I was gone. Simple. Do you know what, Jeff? I was, I was in the meeting directly after that one meeting that you had with Nigel. Remember, we would all go in each year for these like review meetings, wouldn't we? Yeah. One by one. And I remember you walked by and I went in and I was directly in after you and Nigel was sat there with his head in his hands and he looked like he'd been crying. I don't know for sure. I yeah. went, what? What on earth has gone on? And he went, I've just lost my favourite male gladiator. I'll never forget that. Nigel had a lot of love for me. I had a lot of love for him as well. You know, mm -hmm. uh, he was he was touched by it. And so so was I. And is that how you hope, looking back, that you, it perhaps could have been played out, that they'd said, clean up? It would have been nice, yeah. It would have been nice to have been given that opportunity to rectify or, or to put right whatever it was I was being accused of but uh, that never happened like i said it was just over in a in a blink of an eye you know i had to take the g off my g i feel like i was being branded Do you know that program where they, the guy take rips off his epilepsy his epilepsy off his shoulder and breaks the sword in, uh, over his knee i i felt like i was sent out into the wilderness it was a trying time <laughs> Jefferson, could I just say to you, we've we've had a number of calls today. I, I'll just read out a couple. Mariana uh, Diandino from uh, Birmingham, uh, Mrs. Wiseman from Grimsby. They both they both just say the same thing. They say their sons, in particular, idolise you. Shadow, in particular, they're both crying. They don't know how to explain the situation to these kids. Can Shadow say something to explain to all the children who have held him as their hero for years what this is all about? What what would you say about your situation about drugs? And do you feel you've let these kids down? Yeah, I feel I've let them down terribly. Um, having the admiration and the love uh, that the kids offer myself and the rest of my people is enormous. And that is probably the only thing that grieves me. I would, My message would have to be um, to stay away from drugs and stay away from people that do drugs. Um, love your parents and do your homework and keep watching Gladiators on a Saturday night. But in all seriousness... Um, Stay away from drugs. As I understand it, from here on in, Nigel, he cannot call himself Shadow. Mm. You become Jefferson King. How understanding have you been of his situation? Because have you not, in a way, created an impossible brief for these guys? They are the nearest thing to superheroes that kids have in the flesh. They've got to live up to an ideal. They do. Is it, is it possible, week in, week out, to live up to that? They have to be winners. They do. It's not just that. There are lots of other side things, like the charities that they do. Yeah. Um, I know, you know, we don't publicise the fact of the amount of work that they do. I know Shadow's been to a, a, a child's bedside and talked him out of a coma. Now, these things aren't publicised, but this is the power, the wonderful power they have of being kids' heroes. Now, if they are going to be that, then they must suffer the price. And if they make a mistake, there is a consequence, and that consequence at the moment is to be fired from Gladiators. Well, Nigel, you've been seen to act. We wish you well in, in the task ahead of you. Uh, Jefferson, obviously, very difficult time 
for you, but for the last time, Shadow, thank you very, thank you very much indeed. But you know, you, you're still a massive celebrity and in the hearts of so, so many, and particularly once people listen to your story right now, would you want to do any of the big TV shows out there right now to, to test your strength and your wit and your mental courage? I think I'm too old for that now. I, 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 I'm just looking to salvage what I can. Yeah, I'm looking to salvage myself. I'm looking to salvage the person that I am. Yeah, I'm looking to salvage what I can. You know, I, I'm getting into my artwork and tattooing and uh, personal training. That sounds like you're doing it really well, Jeff. You know, how did you discover your art talent? I've always been able to draw. I've always been able to see something, copy it and and enjoy it as it as is. I'm trying to break into the tattoo tattooing world. You know, if I can produce that on paper, I know producing it on skin is different, but some of the work that I have seen that people have done or, you know, I believe that I can do that. No, I can uh, I can get involved in that. And I talk to people with uh, you know mental health problems and uh, addiction problems. Uh, I I used to work for a company called Intuitive Recovery where they do a four day course for people with alcohol and drug addiction, uh, just showing them, making them realize there's a part of the brain that, you know, encourages you to do things that you would normally do all the time and, and having that understanding. So, yeah, I would like to get into all that, all that again, you know, talking and help and helping people. I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. So, yeah, I'm, I'm looking to go in that direction again. Oh, please do, you know, because it, it means so much when somebody has gone through a period of their life whereby parts of the brain have changed for whatever reason and there are addictions involved or a need to kind of blot out or blank things, it means so much to somebody, as you well know, who's actually been there yeah. you know, and understand the actual mechanisms behind what that can mean and how much it can change someone's life. But there's always hope you can change again. I'm not, set, I'm not setting out to, to be in the public eye as such again. You know, my, I've had my time. My, my, I've had my time. My son my son at the moment is doing fantastic. He's over in Thailand, been there for the last year training just to just won his first title belt and you know doing the Muay Thai and everything. He's he's doing fantastic. I get I get great inspiration from him. My daughter's doing fantastic. Like I said, I'm just out to salvage myself. <laughs> yeah. We always ask our guests this question: if if we had the ability right now to press a button and all go back to 1992 and do it all over again, would you go back and and what would you do differently? Yeah, I would go back. Yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that time in my life. What I would do differently? Choose my friends more wisely. Having chosen friends more wisely, do you think you would have stayed on the show? There's no classroom to go to 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 you know to be taught how to how to be in in the industry, how to uh, safeguard yourself, uh, how to be around the right people and, and have the right connections and be seen in the right places. That, that, you know, my life carried on as, as normal, but it wasn't normal. And having that understanding, I never had that understanding of what it was that we had created, what it was, what position it was that we held, if that makes any sense. But it was bigger than me, much, much bigger than me. And not having the understanding of, you know, I never set out to be a celebrity. I never set out to be this person on, on TV. I, 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 was, I was doing very well in bodybuilding. I was just about so pro. I would have made good money doing uh, professional bodybuilding. That opportunity came up and, and I seized it, thinking, well, you know, this is a good way for me to show my body do something with my body in a program that I had was accustomed to watching the American one and I thought yeah I just fit right in there but no one no one's there to teach you uh, the do's and the don'ts if you make mistakes along the way that they could cost you or if you're lucky enough they don't cost you so what advice would you give to the the reboot that's coming up good luck to them we have to wait and see how it turns out but uh, yeah good luck to them I hope they have the same uh, get up and go that we had Jeff that was one thing I was going to ask you about actually because I'm assuming at the time once it all news broke that you know you're no longer on the show well, that must have been quite an overwhelming time because not only are you processing not being on the show anymore, you're also having to deal presumably with reporters knocking at your door and ev everything else being played in the public domain. But there was no social media back then. So, and we've we've seen with quite a few stories recently how all conquering it can be when these kind of stories light up. But just touching first of all on your processing leaving gladiators, but at the same time having all this aired out in public, aren't you? That must have been quite overwhelming at the time. Yeah, I used to be frightened to get phone calls. Jeff, have you seen the newspaper? Oh my God, what's in it now? You know, it was like nearly every Sunday. I mean, don't forget, 
dealing with news of the world now and and papers like that overwhelming and um, you know uh, i think if i was any less of a per- lesser of a person I, I i may have jumped off a bridge or something it was um yeah it was pretty intense right? it was pretty intense and that's without things like social media as well like if you added that oh, on top oh, yeah imagine and i guess that's the big issue that the new gladiators are going to have that yeah like i say good luck to them you know they, they've got a They've got a big mission, a task in front of them because of the social media and everything else. Uh, but I'm sure they'd be fine. From what I've seen, that I haven't really seen them all, but for the ones I have seen, they, they look apart. You have big sons and daughters of the guys that were fans for us who will be watching this reboot. It's a whole generation of new fans coming through. Do you think that's a, a nice thing for this day, uh, age and day and stage that we're all at right now? There's so much going on. I mean, you've got Ninja Warriors, you've, you've got all kinds of, you've got, you've got all kinds of Skull Island, you've got all kinds of things going on. It's going to be, I reckon it's going to be a hard task to, to uh, <laughs> capture the attention of the British public. Yeah. I think it's going to be a hard task. You know, all credit to them. You know, I haven't seen anything or, you know, but it's going to be a hard task. Let's see what happens. Did you watch the Gladiators after you left? No, didn't watch a single program. What about the, the Sky One version, the reboot? Did you... Were you kind of hoping that you might have come back to one of the Legends episodes? Listen, they did not invite me to anything. I was an outcast. For that reason, I, I just, you know, okay, if that's it, that's it. What am I to do? What am I going to do? Pull my hair out? We spoke to Rhino, Mark Smith, about coming in yeah. and trying to fill your, your shoes. And I mean, he was like, you can't no. fill shadow, shadow shoes. I'm glad you said that, not me. But yeah, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And well, he said it. He said it on the club. But what did you think about about him coming in? I didn't know him beforehand. I didn't really stop to think anything really of him coming in. I know he did try to have a presence, but as you just stated, you know, it wasn't there for whatever reasons. Maybe again, like I said, you know, things you take into the arena. If they're not hundred percent focused on what it is you're there for, you can get lost in the moment. This is this is definitely a producer Paul question, Jeff. But the, yeah, the press have always said that yeah. you are an extra in the Spice Girls movie Spice World. Is that true? It's true. It's, it's, uh, I was in a. They filmed a, a nightclub scene where they all get up on this. Um, they had these like platforms that were above the crowd, and the five girls. Is it five girls? Yeah, they were on one platform, and me and a few other guys were on another platform. Yeah, and I remember them screaming across, "Oh my God, there's Shadow! There's Shadow!" <laughs> I'd have to try and find a copy of that movie now and go back and watch it. <laughs> Looking ahead now, yeah. do you think right now today you are on the right track? And and I know you alluded to it, but earlier on, but where is that direction going to take you? Where where do you hope to to be in 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 the years? to come what what's the future looking like for you now i said trying to salvage what i can having a sense of purpose you know i'm going to go with what i know and i am a personal trainer i am an artist and i'm going to just go with those things really i'm i'm happy now anyway i'm happy i'm happy the way my kids are the way my kids have turned out what, what they do you know i've had my life my life's not over but you know i'm just trying to salvage myself and and try and find some direction whatever might come from that i i don't know i don't know what the future holds on behalf of the bands that have held you in their hearts like throughout all of these years and and despite everything and and seeing you he looks so well he's going to just make all of those fans just so happy to know that you are doing well and just remember that we're behind you supporting you thank you ever so much i i really mean that um the messages that i get are very uh oh it's lovely it's just lovely to think that you know my god i i I used to sort of think who wants to know what I'm doing, you know, 30 years down the road? You know, who, who really cares? But there are a lot of people out there that have shown me bare love. Can't put a price on that, can you? Wow. Shadow on the Glad Pod. Producer Paul, I never thought this day would happen. I just thinking when we started the Glad Pod and everything that he was going through and every, all the headlines we were reading, I never thought we'd get to the stage where he'd be on the Glad Pod. No, I must admit when I when I eventually got in touch with him because over the years we'd spoken about getting him on the Glad Pod for Series 1. We'd spoken about getting him to some of the Comic Cons to kind of take part and then I lost his number and his number wasn't working and stuff like that. So once I knew that he was contactable again, trying to find a way of getting in touch with him to be like, we'd love to speak to you. What do you think about it? And there was discussions between the two 
of us of like, hey, how do, how do we make this work? What do we talk about? How do we kind of make it happen and, and things like that? So yeah, I was so glad to obviously have Shadow as part of the Glad Pod. He is a massive part of Gladiator's history. He is probably the one Gladiator that everybody has a memory for. And hopefully speaking to him and, and kind of talking through his Gladiator history will just remind some people of what a really great gladiator he was. I'm going to admit that following this, I felt really strange for a few days because it, I was there at the moment that it actually ended for Jeff. I'll never forget that. It, it stayed with me and also massive affection that uh, our then boss, Nigel Lithgow, had for this athlete, this phenomenal athlete with incredible drive. And for a gladiator who possibly did very little in terms of presence on the show, he's the one that actually remains as the the biggest presence, even though he only did three seasons out of some of the glads, say like Lightning, who've done it forever. He's the one remaining of the biggest memory. And I, and I, I absolutely, yeah, I felt really, I f- it was a privilege to one, get to pull up alongside him and find out more about his life and what it was like for him back then. And what I think was really good is we really let him kind of drive where he wanted to go and explore his memories of all those years ago and what was going on for him. And I just, he just did it so well. Well. And I think as well for me, just thinking back then, it was when he did exit Gladiators back in 94, 95, it was a massive deal to a lot of fans who were young, who looked up to this guy as a role model, as a hero. Um, and I was probably one of those kids as well. So I think for me, it was just nice to get him on to go back and just kind of forget all of the other stuff that's happened and just celebrate him as Shadow and go down that side of his story rather than focus on all of the uh, stuff in his personal life. We didn't really go into too much about his life after Gladiators. You know, we we kind of did enough in terms of just talking a little bit sort of surface level with him around that. But I, I personally felt we're a podcast about the Gladiators and he has done other interviews with other podcasts about his time in prison. And I just felt it was important for us to perhaps spend more of our time talking about that time in his life. I also felt him coming on the Glad Pod was a way of kind of olive branching or actually reaching out. You could hear how hurt he was about the reunions and not still being in touch with all the gladiators. That was probably for me the, the most shocking things to take away from that. Or something that surprised me was just that he would love to be part of a reunion. Di, you mentioned as well about Nigel. There must be a way I don't know how we'd do it be great if we could do it so they were both in the UK and we actually got them to meet face to face not do it perhaps on Zoom but just do it face to face you know both of them sitting there together we could do it whereby we record something and they you know have and then they then they can go off you're right Di it, Nigel spoke so lovingly of Jeff and he did about Nigel and I think that would be incredibly powerful it really would be I agree if there's some magic that can be done with that I would be there with bells on with my hankies <laughs> <laughs> and Paul, I had no idea that he was such a talented artist. That was another new thing for me. Yeah, an artist learning to tattoo. It's like, I wonder if there's any Glad fans out there that would go and get a tattoo by Shadow. <laughs> but again, the Glad pod delivers on random facts about these people. And we finally got confirmation that he was in the Spice Girls movie. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I know, that is one of the random pieces of information that was always just a small fact that was in the newspaper that I could never really find out if it was 100% true or not. What I found interesting with it, that when we spoke about gladiators, he lit up. He was speaking about how much he loved being a gladiator, what it represented. You know, I thought it was quite sweet that he didn't want to set out to be famous and he kind of had no idea how massive the show would be or how popular the shadow would be and that he would go back and do it all again. I definitely felt like in that chat with him, we spent a big chunk of that time talking about gladiators and just how much he came to life with it. As soon as we turned the dial to go towards just the life after, he became very careful with his choice of words. And maybe for him, that is his way of keeping his his mind focused on what lies ahead. Would he go back and do it again? I would. I would choose my friends more wisely. That was something I wrote down here. But look, he remembers his time of gladiator with such fondness. And that's definitely one thing that I'm going to take away from that. It's just how much he loved being a gladiator. No, it was great to kind of, I suppose, just go full circle. And definitely it felt weird not having him as part of the Glad Pod. So it was great to kind of have that opportunity. And hopefully the fans have enjoyed this episode. Paul, Di, thank you so much. Remember, guys, you can get in touch with the Glad Pod by emailing gladpod at gladiatorstv.com 
or you can send us a message on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Thank you so much for joining us this week. We'll see you again soon. Good competition, good spirit, great sportsmanship as both contenders show mutual respect. Join us again next week for the ultimate challenge, the might of...